Good morning, everybody, and welcome to session three of the Association for the Cuban Economy uh, webinar. Um, the panelists on our panel this morning um, are um, uh, an interesting group. Uh, I will go, I'm going to introduce each one individually before uh, the individual's presentation. Uh, so before I do that, though, let me say a few things. First of all, we don't want you to submit questions through chat. You shouldn't be able to. Um, just submit questions through the question and answer process. I will introduce each panelist. And then after all the panelists have completed making their presentations, we will consider questions. I will present questions to the panelists, but the panelists will be able to see the questions themselves and will be able to select questions even if I don't. Um, choose those questions. So that's, that's the, how we're gonna operate. So we're very happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Natalia Delgado, and uh, I am now, I, I now direct the Cuba Capacity Building Project at Columbia Law School, which is designed to help create legal institutions in Cuba for Cuba to transition to more of a market economy. Um, and my uh, background is I went to Oberlin College and just like Sylvia, went to University of Michigan, but I went there for my law school. And uh, then I had uh, about 22 years of, of uh, private practice as a corporate and securities lawyer doing mergers and acquisition transactions, offerings of securities in the public and private markets, working on international deals. And then I went in-house and became general counsel and part of the executive team for a public company. So my experience is not academic. It comes out of the business world, both as a lawyer and as a quasi business person. Um, so let me introduce my, our first panelist, which is, who is uh, Sid Casa. Uh, she has an MBA and an MA from University of Michigan. Uh, she's also <clears throat> holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago, where she specialized in democracy, as well as stratification and in Latin American studies. Um, she now teaches at the University of Michigan, and she's received many grants and awards, which they're numerous, and you can look up her bio to get all the details. She's the author of four books and numerous articles. Uh, a few of her pu publications include Political Disaffection in Cuba's Revolution. Ooh. The frequently reviewed by the press. Uh, so that is Sylvia, our first panelist. I'll introduce the other panelists uh, before each of their presentations. So Thank you. Uh, I remind the panelists to uh, get on mute, mute yourself so Sylvia doesn't have any interference. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? It's okay. Okay, great. Uh, uh, yeah. This is this is part of uh, this is part of my work with Carlos Antonio Romero, who should be here with us, but apparently is having internet difficulties. He's at, in Caracas at the Universidad Central de Venezuela, and it's a chapter in our book. Our book will be uh, called "Revolutions in Cuba and Venezuela." One Hope, Two Realities. It will be published by the University of Florida Press. Uh, in Cuba, the appreciation for la buena medicina, as it was always called, high quality medicine, is very old. It really goes all the way back to the 19th century with Carlos Finlay's important research. Uh, but nonetheless, during the revolution, public health became a source of pride, enabling access to health care for everyone in the island in remote rural areas and in mountains through the policlinicos. In the beginning years of the revolution, there was a massive outpouring of doctors from Cuba, about 90% of them left to such an extent that Cuba barred doctors from leaving and instead began training new doctors in essentially uh, public health, uh, primary health care. Thanks to the subsidy of the Soviet Union, Cuba was able to make a massive investment in health care. And for 30, 30 years, the government spent 7% of its gross domestic product on the health sector. I have throughout my presentation put in parentheses the work that I think you should read with respect to some of the points that I make. 
and that is the work of Carmelo Mesalago and Jorge Perez Lopez. In 1984, then, Cuba began a program called Medicina General Integral, Comprehensive Health Medicine, to prevent illness, taking into account not only the physical ailments that people said that they had, but also the social conditions where they lived. Okay, for example, poverty, overcrowding, lack of access to uh, clean, healthy water, and so on. And the result was that a mystique developed around the figure of the neighborhood doctor. Okay, I should say, by the way, that I am relying on materials that I learned from interviewing uh, doctors and health personnel, both in, uh, after they left Venezuela, and also in Cuba, I did informal interviews and this notion of the mystique that developed around the figure of the neighborhood doctor is the result of one of those informal interviews. So real advances in public health took place. This is a photo from the MinRex. Uh, I have now put under each photo, the source of the photo because, because people were always asking me, where did you get that photo from? Uh, all of my photos but one, which I took myself, I actually got from uh, Google Images and their free photos, to my knowledge. Uh, and so this one was taken by uh, the people in MinRex. And it, you know, it, it does a good job of showing how people in Cuba went in all the way into the rural areas to create the polyclinicos and to give people in Cuba access, uh, people who had lived in very remote sort of areas. One of the major gains of the public health investment and effort in Cuba was the infant mortality rate, which is a major indicator uh, from uh, health statistics uh, across the world. Uh, this, these are statistics from the OECD. And you can see that in 1960, these were the figures. The US had 25.9 infants who died in the first year of life, zero to one. Per thousand life births, Cuba 64.6, Dominican Republic 131.3. By 2015, Cuba's indicator of infant mortality rate was actually lower, 5.2, than the US, 5.8. Okay, you can also see impressive gains in all of these countries, but indeed, most impressive is Cuba's infant mortality rate. Now, why the infant mortality rate decline? Well, in great part because the prenatal care was very, very good. They put a lot of effort, a lot of work in staying with the women, accompanying the women in the nine months of the pregnancy to make sure that you know, there was a good birth outcome. It is, however, important to also realize that in Cuba, abortion is practiced very freely uh, no qualms about it, no anti-abortion movement, and they practice it very late term. I mean, you can in fact have an abortion in Cuba and people do uh, in the eighth month if you know for a fact that there's going to be something very wrong with that birth. And if you look at the formula that is used to calculate everywhere in the world, the infant mortality rate, you can see that it's number of deaths of children in the first year of life over the number of births in the same year. So if you get rid of babies that are, for one reason or another, a form of a malformation, uh, they actually don't make it into the first year of life. And that is also part of the reason that there is a huge infant mortality rate decline. And for that, I refer you to the work of Robert Gonzalez, who uh, has studied the infant mortality rate in many countries and who has presented this work in ASCII in years past. From 1968 on, then Cuba began engaging in what they called medical diplomacy, okay? And that meant that thousands of Cuban health workers became part of humanitarian medical missions to help people in developing countries and to buy goodwill for Cuba, okay? Part of the reason that everybody, all the countries vote with Cuba at the United Nations is because of this medical diplomacy program. And here I refer you to the work of Julie Fine Silver, who has documented this effort very, very well. However, typically these uh, medical missions were very small, between 50 to at the most 100 doctors. They went to work in areas where there had been a crisis, hurricanes, earthquakes, or something like the Ebola infection, and their stay was brief. Here's a very nice photo of a Cuban doctor uh, taking care of a little girl 
Uh, so uh, things change after the special period. And I think everybody who's listening to us knows that the special period was what happened in Cuba after the collapse of the Soviet Union and communism in the Eastern European countries. And Cuba went into an enormous economic and political crisis, but particularly economic, and GDP contracted by 35% in only three years. Okay. And so after the special period in the 1989 to 1994 were the worst years, this medical diplomacy increased dramatically and Cuba began sending 25,000 Cuban doctors and health personnel to 68 nations. And particularly they worked in Latin America, in Bolivia, in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in Asia, the Solomon Islands, Indonesia, China, in Africa, Zanzibar, Angola, West Africa, and South Africa. Some of the uh, 30 interviews that I did with Cuban doctors who had first worked in Venezuela and then left Venezuela uh, for the United States uh, were people who had worked in Guatemala, people who had worked in the Seychelles Islands, people who had worked in actually Pakistan, also uh, South Africa, everywhere. Okay, then under Hugo Chavez, when Chavez arrived in 1999, from then on, Ch Chavez um, created what he called the Misiones Sociales, which were part of the larger umbrella program called Barrio Adentro, inside the, the barrio. And that meant that he brought Cuban health workers to work in the rural areas, very isolated places, and with urban shanty towns. And he, as the Cuban health workers gave free primary health care for the poor in these areas that the Venezuelan doctors had trouble reaching. At the peak moment, there were 50,000 Cuban health workers. So there's a huge difference between the typical medical diplomacy that Cuba practiced with 100, 150 doctors. And this was 50,000 Cuban health workers. And that whenever I say doctors, I really mean doctors, nurses, ophthalmologists, dentists, health personnel. As of mid 2020, Cuba still had 22,000, Venezuela still had 22,000 Cubans working there. And the agreement was that Venezuela paid Cuba with oil 100,000 barrels of oil a day. So here's a very nice photo from Havana Times, which will make uh, Gary May Barduk very happy uh, uh, with an article of theirs on Cuban doctors in Venezuela. And you can see again, a Cuban doctor taking care of a Venezuelan child and the poster in the back saying, welcome, bienvenidos, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez, uh, together, cuates, as they would say in Mexico. Okay, to, so why did so many Cuban doctors go to Venezuela to work? Well, they were mostly motivated by their expectation of economic gains, okay? The fact is that people in Cuba, as you have heard, I'm sure, in every presentation, can't make do, cannot make do with what they earn. The typical salary was 25 US dollars, while a salary in Venezuela sounded like it was so much more, $250 a month. Once they got to Venezuela, most of them realized that $250 in Venezuela doesn't go very far either. But at least, you know, there was an expectation that they could save and return to Cuba with savings. In addition, the Cuban government uh, had made a bank account uh, in Cuba where $50 was deposited every month while the Cuban doctors worked overseas and they were to receive that money when they returned, okay? Plus they were able to bring back to Cuba what Cubans love to call electrodomesticos, which means refrigerator, microwave, and air conditioning. However, they, there were also losses attached to this. They were not allowed to bring any family with them. They were completely alone. And some of the interviews that I uh, made of people who had worked in very far away rural areas where there was nobody but them and a few people in a very small rural area, a lady who cooked meals for them. But, you know, there, it was very isolating. It was very lonely. And they were constantly watched by the head of their brigade who lived with them. This was typical of the people who were in Caracas and other major cities. There was a lot of surveillance. If, for example, they kept their passports uh, from them, you know, the, the head of the brigade kept the passport. 
Uh, moreover, if they did not return to Cuba, they lost the money that they had in their bank account. They never got it. And their immediate family was not allowed to join them for some years. One of the interviews that I made, uh, he left Venezuela for the United States and his daughter was not allowed to join him for seven years. So many people asked, is this a form of medical diplomacy or is it a form of contemporary slavery? That's a nice photo. The fact is that because of all these conditions, there were over the years increasing defections. Okay. The number of Cubans who defected and left Venezuela for mostly Colombia, but also Panama for the United States increased. In the United States alone, it's estimated that it, there's about 6,000 people uh, who had previously worked in, in Venezuela. Uh, there is a non not-for-profit organization that was created by some of the former doctors, Solidaridad Sin Fronteras, which is in Hialeah, Miami. Uh, and it organized to help these former Cuban doctors leave Venezuela and to successfully become part of life in the United States. You can see this is a picture of Cuban doctors defend, defecting from Venezuela, from the Miami Herald. And of course they look like, you know, Cubans look everywhere. Uh, I did, like I was saying before, 30 interviews with doctors who left Venezuela and other countries. And I found three major types of motivations. I'm not going to go into the interview materials because there's no way that I can convey in the short amount of time that one is allotted in these <laughs> PowerPoint presentations. And what is interesting about interviews is to see people's attitudes and to see the experiences that they had and how the attitudes changed over time. And that takes you know, space and time. Uh, but I found three major types of motivations. I found some people were economic immigrants who left Cuba to work in Venezuela, but they were expecting to return to Cuba, okay? So it was just a, a good economic opportunity, okay? But returning to Cuba. There were also people who were refugees, okay? And I called refugees the people who were profoundly disaffected politically, okay? And to them, they knew that they wanted to leave Cuba and this was an opportunity. This was like a balsa, a way of leaving Cuba, okay? Uh, not necessarily on their first trip. Sometimes one of the people that I interviewed had first worked in Pakistan and then eventually he worked in Venezuela and then he left uh, for the United States from Venezuela. And then the people that I personally found the most interesting were people who had initially left Cuba as economic immigrants with every intention to return but their experiences working in Venezuela had turned them into refugees, had turned them into political immigrants. And those were very interesting for me. Okay, US policy towards Cuban doctors, uh, President George W. Bush created the Cuban Medical Professionals Parole in 2006 to facilitate their arrival. Essentially, it was a way of processing their papers quickly because people, the Cuban doctors were leaving Venezuela, for example, crossing over to Colombia, which is fairly easy to do, uh, but then their papers would take a very long time to be processed by the American embassy. And so this was a way of making sure that people could come to the United States uh, uh, more quickly, okay? Uh, the Cuban medical parole program that was initiated by George W. Bush, however, was canceled by Barack Obama at the same time that Obama did away with the wet foot, dry foot immigration policy, just as he was leaving office and had uh, just a few days left. Uh, ex I, with respect to Cuba, exporting doctors as a commodity, that is in exchange for money, in exchange for oil, in this case, was a result of the special period. Okay, uh, and, but it over time became one of the major forms that the Cuba-Venezuela alliance took, okay? The Cuba-Venezuela alliance is formidable. Uh, and Cuba's economy had three pillars to it in, in recent years, certainly not sugar as it was historically in the past, but it was tourism, which has now collapsed under the circumstances of the COVID and family remittances, which have now become very problematic for people in Cuba. So the Cuban doctors were actually the third major pillar of the Cuban economy. This uh, Cuban doctors were important to Venezuela for a very long time, okay? 
But with Chavez's arrival in 1999 and the trade agreement that Cuba and Venezuela reached, Venezuela was sending 100,000 barrels of oil daily to Cuba, and Cuba was uh, paying for it by sending health workers. Today, the quality of healthcare in Cuba has declined enormously. Okay, due to a combination of the contemporary economic crises, which you have heard about yesterday, and I need not repeat, and the massive export of doctors. Okay, now here I picked up a few pieces of data from Cuba's Anuarios Estadísticos de Salud Pública from the work of Mirta Fernandez and Pablo Diaz SP. And you can see the nature of the decline in healthcare in Cuba in 2007 compared to two, 10 years later in 2017. In 2007, there were doctors working in consultorios where over 36,000, okay? In 2017, there were only 13,000. In 27, maternal mor mortality was 31 per 100,000. In 2017, maternal mortality had increased to 44 per 100,000. The health infrastructure in Cuba in 2007 was reasonable. They could deliver good health care. The health infrastructure now is an incredible decline, okay? Many, many, many hospitals in Cuba have closed. The polyclinics all over the rural areas and the remote towns have closed. Of course, that means that the number of hospital beds is very small. There is a very good article today in the Miami Herald by Nora Gámez Torres on the uh, impact of the COVID inf uh, on the health infrastructure in Cuba, and I highly recommend it to you. But this also has meant that in 2007, people in Cuba could get medicines. You could go to the doctor, they could give you a prescription, and you could go and get the medicine. But for quite some time now, there have been no medicines. The last time I was in Cuba, I was very impressed by a visit that I made to a small town outside of Havana, Madruga, to be exact. Uh, and one of the ladies in the family that I was speaking with came very happily to show me that she had a health problem, a heart problem. And this was the prescription from the doctor, but she said, but I can't get this medicine. So this is just a piece of paper <laughs> that said, you know, if you have a prescription and you can't get the, the heart medicine, it is in fact only a piece of paper, okay? And so you remember before I talked about the fact that the public health advances in Cuba had been uh, so real and profound that a mystical halo had developed around the figure of the doctor. And what people in Cuba told me is that that mystical halo has now disappeared. It is also the case that in these recent years, there have been numerous epidemics of contagious diseases such as dengue and cholera, and that has resulted in many deaths. Uh, my book that Natalia mentioned, Political Disaffection in Cuba's Revolution and Exodus, 2007, uh, included a very good interview from a very nice young man uh, who enabled me to understand many things about life in Cuba for the poor black community that lived in the outskirts of Havana. He actually died of dengue a few years ago as his uh, brother informed. So look at this photo from Reuters, the alliance between Cuba and Venezuela, Chavez and Fidel. This photo was taken in 2005 when Chavez visited the University of Havana. And it is a statement, you know, it's a, it's a medal that they were given by the students, but it is a statement about the fact that their alliance was formidable and that they expected that they would both rise or fall together. But of course they expected that they would succeed uh, in, as a result of their common alliance. As I said, it was a formidable alliance uh, for Chavez Barrio Adentro. At its peak, there were 50,000 doctors. There's now still 22,000 Cuban doctors working in Venezuela. However, Venezuela is now caught in a spiral of its own and its assistance has been declining and cannot be counted upon. It's also become erratic some months shipments arrive and some months shipments do not arrive. Here's the oil shipments to Cuba and their decline. In 2000 to 2012, the figure was still 100,000 barrels a day. By 2016, it had declined to 65,000 barrels a day. 
by 2019, it had declined to 43,000 barrels a day, and it had already uh, become, as I said, erratic. I, this is the last time I was in Cuba. And now, they're, Carlos says they're not publishing the official figure, but it's about 10,000 barrels a day. So it's minimal. So Venezuela's assistance has, in fact, uh, disappeared. This is my photo. <laughs> I am happy to report this is a Venezuelan ship that enters Havana Harbor. And it, as it entered with its little tugboat, it passed by the Cristo de Havana. And I happen to be standing here with a very dear friend of mine, El Padre Mario Delgado. Um, and we took the, the photo. I took the photo. So as we know, in Venezuela, the economy has collapsed. The phrase, a collapsed economy, comes from the work of Jose Manuel Puente, uh, which together with Carlos Antonio Romero will tell you that the hyperinflation has been extraordinary. extraordinary. I mean, it's, you know, they're now printing new paper, new currencies, that are, which are paper. <laughs> there is a very severe lack of food and medicines. For many people, the hunger is constant. Public services have broken down, electricity, water, gas, communication has crumbled. Uh, there is a lack of tra transportation. So the economy has collapsed and the result has often been unrest, massive street protests. In conclusion, the Cuba-Venezuela alliance was a form of South-South collaboration, a new model for the underdeveloped world that could have been a good model for the underdeveloped world. However, neither Cuba nor Venezuela will admit it, but the alliance no longer has the strength it had due to both their economic and political crises that I think are internally caused. And neither Cuba nor Venezuela can any longer uphold one another, nor can they provide the real challenge that they wanted to provide to the capitalist world. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. I uh, think that Carlos would like to uh, comment now. Carlos will be commenting in Spanish on the same subject. Okay. Can I start? Can I start? Yeah. Let me, say, let me before you do that, though. Let me say a few words about you to the audience. Uh, Carlos Antonio Romero Mendez is a political scientist from Florida. He obtained his BA in political. Uh, studies from the Central University of Venezuela in 1978. He has a master's in political science from the University of Pittsburgh uh, in 1979 and a PhD in political sciences from the Central University in Venezuela in 1989. He's an emeritus professor, researcher with the rank of full professor in the Institute of Political Studies of the Faculty of Law and Political Studies at the Central University of Venezuela. He has published six books individually, 17 in collaboration, and more than 130 articles. And he's done numerous presentations, uh, almost hard to count, presentations and internships and visiting professorships in different parts of the world. Uh, I hope that's a good idea, <laughs> Carlos, a scholarship from that. So uh, please go ahead, Carlos, with your comments. Bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación a participar junto con Silvia en esta importante reunión. Eh, yo quiero anexar algunas cosas, más que repetir lo que dijo Silvia muy bien y que está en todos los charts. Eh, y son tres elementos fundamentales. Primero, eh, ver cómo se puede trasladar la relación cubano-venezolana hacia los de abajo, es decir, hacia un momento, hacia un cuadro de, in, de información social en el cual está alejada de los elementos tradicionales de las relaciones institucionales entre dos países. Eh, entonces, esa concepción de los de abajo, eh, a mi modo de ver, ayuda mucho a este capítulo que es eh, un capítulo humano. Y es humano en segundo lugar porque eh, en, las diferentes, en los diferentes in, interviews que se hicieron, eh, uno puede deducir dos cosas muy importantes. Primero y principal que hay, como dijo Silvia, diversas motivaciones para venir a Venezuela 
desde que se instrumentalizó el programa en el año 2003. Pero ahí hay una, a mi modo de ver, que es fundamental desde Cuba. Y esa es la racionalidad económica de venir a Venezuela para un trampolín para de, de dejar de lado la revolución cubana. Eh, no, hay un, no hay un número suficiente de ejemplos de esta situación. Es cierto que la cancelación del programa de Parol y la, y la cancelación del programa de los pies mojados, pies secos, pies mojados, ha disminuido, pero ha disminuido la, la deserción para aquellos que piensan ir a los Estados Unidos, porque ha habido una decepción muy grande en Ecuador, en Brasil, en, en Perú, en Colombia mismo, y por supuesto los que llegan de Venezuela que van a estos países esperando una oportunidad para ir a los Estados Unidos. Entonces, esa dimensión humana tiene otro elemento también que no se contaba en el año 2003, que es el deterioro de la sociedad venezolana. Es decir, la violencia también ha arrastrado a los cubanos que han venido en los programas sociales por una razón muy sencilla, porque fueron colocados y han sido colocados y están colocados en sectores muy pobres de la población venezolana, sectores no solamente en la ciudad, sino también en el interior del país. Y están sufriendo, igual que los venezolanos, de las características de violencia, de la falta de institucionalización, de la hiperinflación, etc. Y por lo tanto, comparado con el año 2003, 2004, hasta el 2012 aproximadamente, ya no es racionalmente económico venir a Venezuela. Tengo entendido que algunos que han sido seleccionados para salir en el programa de asistencia cubana trazan a hacer todo lo posible, independientemente que estén con la revolución o no, tratan todo lo posible de no venir a Venezuela porque ya Venezuela no es ni desde el punto de vista económico ni desde el punto de vista social eh, un escenario que puedan desarrollar eh, sus actividades profesionales. Entonces, eso es un segundo punto. Y un tercer punto que tiene que ver ya con la caracterización de las relaciones cubano-venezolanas eh, a pesar de todos estos elementos y los elementos económicos, etcétera, la relación cubano-venezolana sigue siendo muy importante para ambos países y para el resto de América Latina. Se, se conservan lo, en una disminución, por supuesto, muy grande, pero se conservan los programas de asistencia social, los programas de asistencia económica, se conservan los problemas de asistencia tecnológica, de la, de la asistencia petrolera, de la asistencia eh, de inteligencia, etcétera, y ahorita acabamos de verlo como un ejemplo y con eso termino, eh, cuando hubo los sucesos del 10-11, sobre todo el 11 y el 12 de julio en Cuba, porque hay que decirlo así, en Cuba, porque fueron más de 80 poblaciones donde hubo una cierta caracterización de protesta, eh, unas más, unos menos, eh, inmediatamente el gobierno de Venezuela envió a la vicepresidenta del, del régimen para adelantar una serie de programas de asistencia y de cooperación, no solamente desde el punto de vista de bienes y servicios, sino también desde el punto de vista de política, es decir, de qué hacer, eh, es ciertamente el know-how venezolano ¿verdad? para tratar de temperar, como pareciera que has, ha pasado, eh, de, de reducir la situación de crisis que se vivió. Por lo tanto, eh, quisiera enfatizar que este capítulo del libro que estamos a punto ya de sacar eh, es un capítulo muy humano y es un capítulo que refleja muy bien los eh, whatabouts de la situación venezolana y cubana y la relación entre los dos gobiernos. Muchas gracias. Natalia. Natalia, you have to unmute. I just unmuted, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I was just asking Yvonne to unmute uh, now that we can see him. So <laughs> our, next, our next panelist is Yvonne Grenier. He's a professor of political science at St. Francis Xavier University, and he's a resident scholar at the Mulroney Institute, Institute of Government. I hope I got that right. Um, He's the author of Culture and the Cuban State, Participation, Recognition, and Dissonance Under Communism. Um, he is a regular political commentator for Radio Canada. 
and his current project examines Canadian foreign policy towards Latin America with the focus on human rights and the promotion of democratic values. And his paper will uh, cover that subject with respect to Cuba. So uh, could Yvonne, please um, begin your presentation and thank you. Hey. Can you all see well? Um, can you make it bigger? Uh, I hope so. It's very big on my screen. It's completely big on my screen. Oh, okay. I not on mine, but no. What well, no. really? Try it on slideshow. Yeah, put slideshow. Go to the beginning. Yeah. There, you go. There. there you go. We all, we all, we're still learning about this, eh? <laughs> this. <laughs> <technology>. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you uh, very much for this uh, introduction, Natalia, and I am very happy to be uh, back at uh, ASCII. And I want to uh, take this uh, opportunity to thank very much uh, Sylvia and Larry and Gary and all the great leaders of uh, this uh, association for having been so busy in the past year or so. I don't <laughs> count now how many uh, conferences, webinars that uh -huh. were excellent that were offered to us members and so that uh, we could uh, miss a little bit less uh, the, the annual trip to, uh, to Miami. So I'm very, very um, uh, thankful for that. So yeah, so my paper uh, entitled No Sanction, Explaining Canadian Foreign Policy Toward Cuba uh, it's sort of a funny title, but to tell you the truth, it started as a sort of an e effort to understand Canadian foreign policy toward Venezuela, which is uh, quite extraordinary, uh, both in terms of the, the scope of uh, the policy, the, the commitment, uh, the sanctions, uh, recognizing an interim uh, opposition leaders who, uh, as, as an interim president, uh, an opposition leader as a, a president, and huge efforts uh, to give uh, humanitarian aid. There was a, uh, a conference in Ottawa recently with all the donors. And so I'm just watching this um, being more of a comparative politics uh, specialist, but trying to understand why is this the case? Like, why is it that Canada suddenly decides to go out of its way to, to have a very strong, bold, uh, policy of uh, promoting uh, democratic values and, uh, and human rights. Uh, we all know that uh, it, this is something relatively recent in the history of states, probably by the 80s, 90s, and increasingly uh, states are at least committing themselves to uphold those uh, principles that you find in the, of course, the UN Declaration and the 1976 treaties. And uh, of course, do they do it all the time? The answer is no, because the states are not human rights organizations, states are states. And I tend to have a very much of a realist perspective on states. So they have ob obviously economic and security objectives, uh, which usually trump uh, human rights or, or sort of a projection of uh, values uh, about human rights and democracy. And so clearly in this case, Canada decided to go all the way. And I remember there was a presentation, not a presentation, a sort of a town hall meeting with uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and some fellow came to the microphone, started by saying, congratulations for your policy on Cuba. You're so warm and friendly toward Cuba. I love that. But why is it then that you turn around and you follow Donald Trump and uh, become such a, an enemy of uh, Maduro? And then he goes on and on and explain what he means. And Trudeau's answer was first, thank you very much. And indeed, we're very proud here in Canada to have an independent foreign policy toward Cuba. And then he launches into a tirade against Maduro uh, using the kind of language that you don't hear very often from a prime minister talking about a head of state. And there's no shortage of pretty bad head of state in the world. So I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to understand this and not, uh, not starting with uh, this, this, this uh, uh, readily available explanation that of course the Trudeaus are very friend with the Castro family and that's why, but it's not a sufficient explanation because in a way the parameters of Canadian foreign policy toward Cuba have been pretty much the same since, uh, since uh, Diefenbaker, since the prime minister, uh, conservative prime minister who was 
in Ottawa when the Cuban Revolution uh, triumph and Batista left the island. And there were some differences in the style, um, but by and large, those uh, parameters of uh, constructive engagement, uh, of keeping the lines of communication open, of not uh, supporting sanctions, not supporting the embargo, Canada and Mexico were the only two countries in the hemisphere that did not support uh, the US embargo. And quite, you know, not, not that often, but uh, three times the prime ministers uh, went to visit Cuba, an official visit. They were all liberals. Uh, two of them were Trudeau's and they were really gushing for like the few days they were there. But once they go back home, Cuba goes back to being a relatively minor uh, concern for Canadian foreign policy. Latin America in general is a relatively minor concern. So within that, Cuba is also a minor concern, although symbolically perhaps more important than uh, the size of it or the economic importance of it would, uh, uh, would dictate. And uh, when I say only three, uh, you know, it's uh, Havana is like three hours flight from uh, Ottawa. So it's not because it's really too far and too cumbersome. Uh, there was never an official visit by a Cuban leader to Canada, although uh, Pierre Trudeau invited Fidel to come. It didn't happen. And recently in 2016, Justin, Justin Trudeau invited Raul Castro to come. It didn't happen either. So, so just, just so that not to exaggerate how warm and fuzzy uh, relations are between uh, between uh, Canada and, and Cuba. So Canada imposes sanctions and related measures against 20 countries in retribution to their gross uh, violation of uh, human rights using either the Special Economic Measure Act, SEMA, or, or more recently the Magnitsky uh, Act, which was adopted by Parliament in 2017 and used recently by Joe Biden actually to impose sanctions, uh, targeted sanctions uh, in Cuba. So. In the Americas, only two of the three dictatorial countries are sanctioned for that reason, Venezuela and Nicaragua, but not the third uh, dictatorship in the hemisphere, Cuba. And one could easily argue, and I don't need to explain this to uh, my audience today, uh, that by design, the Cuban regime is more dictatorial than Venezuela's regime or the Nicaragua's regime. Venezuela, of course, were all out to promote uh, basically regime change. It's not quite at that level in Nicaragua, but it's been actually creeping, uh, you know, becoming more and more of a concern. And Canada is becoming more assertive as well uh, on Nicaragua, although not quite the same as, um, not quite the same as of course, uh, Venezuela. I'm gonna move this here because otherwise I can't see my, my own slide. So, and uh, wait a second, I don't know why, oh, okay. This year. That's right. So in November 16, 2016, Prime Minister Trudeau not only stated that Canada has always been a steadfast and unflinching friend of Cuba, he also declared that Canadian policy toward Cuba is one of the way we reassure ourselves that we are our own country. This was a, a, an answer to a question by a student at the University of Havana when he visited the country in 2016. And I, I'm stunned that it wasn't more of a big deal in the country to say that our relations with Cuba is so important for our own existential angst, uh, and especially, of course, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the United States. Now, a few years later, June 19, uh, 2019, Foreign Minister Christian Freeland said, referring to Venezuela with one voice, we must make it abundantly clear to the international community that the existence of a dictatorship in the Americas will not be tolerated. So she just skipped over effortlessly, uh, the fact that uh, Cuba has had a dictatorship since 1952. Um, it's almost like a pyramid or, you know, something has been around for so long that nobody really pay much attention anymore uh, to uh, how it was made, by whom, under what conditions. It's sort of a symbol and uh, that the dictatorial part of it um, just sort of, uh, she just didn't remember, I guess, when she made that comment and she's a very smart uh, woman. So basically my explanations that I'm trying to come up with, um, and I presented them in a paper that will be published in September, so next month in International Journal, where I'm trying to figure out what are the kind of opportunities that must be in place both in Ottawa and in the country uh, 
so that human rights and democracy, uh, democratic values would be uh, promoted, okay? And it's the case of Canadian foreign policy toward Venezuela. I think it could apply to other countries at both ends of the bilateral relations. Uh, Canada is a middle power, uh, so maybe it's more of a middle power kind of uh, situation, but uh, you'll figure out by yourself if you think it could apply to other countries. So the two variables that I have are one, opportunities for democratization, in this case in Cuba, and second, opportunities to prioritize human rights and democracy in Canadian foreign policy. And so the higher opportunities you have for democratization and, and to prioritize human rights and democracy, the, the more likely a, 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 a robust uh, policy of promotion of human rights and democracy in a, a Canadian foreign policy, okay? So what do I mean by opportunity for democratization? Uh, uh, in two, uh, two major uh, uh, sort of components here, one is a major multi-dimensional and sudden crisis Indicators of crisis include, but are not limited to economic collapse, humanitarian crisis, massive exodus of the population, increased repression and authoritarian consolidation. So you see Venezuela is all over this, right? And second, the presence of a credible democratic opposition ready to champion democratization. So what makes an opposition credible as a democratic force is a combination of organizational coherence, domestic support, international recognition and a public commitment to democratic values, preferably rooted in an existing democratic tradition. So again, very much a Venezuela case, like a, a country that has an inviolable sort of democratic tradition for in South America, where you had an opposition that had won legislative elections, where you had the president of the assembly, the national assembly uh, could actually refer to three articles of the constitution to justify him becoming the interim president of the country, this giving the international community the opportunity to actually support regime change by supporting an inside domestic process, democratic process, where you defend a, 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 an opposition that is committed to democracy and, and has some sort of constitutional and legal actually ground to stand on to make that claim. Uh, obviously something very, very uh, unique again to that situation in Venezuela. And the first observation about opportunity for democratization is that most dictatorial countries have low or no opportunity for democratization whatsoever, either because there's no crisis situation and or because there's no really credible democratic opposition that you could support. And I think it's very important for the international community to have this Otherwise, like in the case of Syria, as the best example, like let's say you want democratization in Syria, who would you support exactly? Uh, you know, at first they talk about uh, some democratic opposition living abroad, but pretty quickly it became obvious that they had no standing, they had no ground support in Syria, and therefore it becomes almost impossible to support democratization in a country like this. Now, opportunity to prioritize human rights and democracy even though all democratic uh, countries uh, claim that it's uh, super important to them, but of course, you know, realist uh, politics, real politics is uh, most of the time more important. So in order to have this opportunity to move forward with that kind of an agenda, you need to have three conditions uh, met. And it's not a matter of yes or no, it's a, of course, you know, you, you, you can have, you know, gradation like from zero to 10 or whatever, if you want to quantify it. Um, first of all, does not threaten economic or security interest. It doesn't uh, jeopardize your trade, your investment, your alliances. Uh, second, present an opportunity for broad-based multilateral action, which is always a plus for a middle power like Canada, uh, and, and by extension for most European countries and the, the kind of country you think about when you think about uh, sort of a relatively well-to-do liberal democracies. It's not indispensable for a superpower like the US, but it's preferable also for the US. You remember that when there were uh, interventions or occupations uh, done um, uh, in the name of uh, democracy and human rights and freedom and all that, like the US usually try to secure some kind of alliance so that it doesn't look like it's going alone. The uh, Magnitsky uh, Act is an interesting one because it allows a country to, uh, to in fact, it lowers the bar uh, 
that make it possible for a country to impose uh, sanctions uh, unilater unilaterally against uh, a certain country. Um, but in, in spite of, the, of, of this, uh, and this could be a sign of uh, more like targeted, smarter sanctions moving forward, more individual sanctions, one country against another country. But in general sanctions, if you look at the sanctions regime, they're usually involving multilateral action. That this make, it makes it, of course, much more effective. And third, does not meet significant opposition in parliament or in public opinion. And so again, a quick, quick review here, uh, looking at Venezuela and Cuba, there's very little uh, economic uh, interest, a Canadian interest in Venezuela. There's a bit more in, in Cuba, although moving forward, of course, Venezuela has much more potential of becoming an interesting trading partner than, than Cuba. Um, an opportunity for broad-based multilateral action uh, this was attempted in the OAS. The OAS is like the League of Nations. It can't move forward because of so many uh, roadblocks. But suddenly there was this option of the Lima Group. Uh, and for this alliance that was created in 2017, uh, Canada was one of the leaders. There's no such thing for, for Cuba. In fact, what you have is more the opposite. It's usually the chorus of Latin American countries insisting that Cuba should be part of the summits of the America. You had, of course, CELAC. And in other bodies, it's always, you know, we want Cuba back. And, uh, and I suspect it's because democratic values are not quite as uh, strong because democracy is young and because of that idea that sovereignty is the most important thing. And sovereignty in Latin America often means that the leaders, the government can do whatever it wants in its, within its own borders. And of course, the mecca of that sovereignty narrative is, is Cuba. So not much of that and does not meet significant opposition in parliament. There's a bit of a path dependency here. Canadians are used to think of Canada as sometimes being independent of the United States. Uh, we didn't we, uh, join in all the wars led by the United States. We didn't go to Iraq, we didn't go to Vietnam. And in this case, we have Cuba. So it's a sort of a symbolic, uh, not very much on the front burner, but it's still symbolic and it's been around for a long time, so it would cost uh, somewhat a uh, government to explain to the population why we should change our policy and then suddenly becoming much more forceful in demanding Cuban regime to democratize and liberalize, okay. 2.1 and 2.3 give policymakers some latitude to formulate initiatives not urgently dictated by hard interest. What I mean by this is that if you look at Canadian relations with the US, it's almost, uh, it, it's not quite a foreign policy issue, it's almost a domestic uh, policy issue. And there is a team, a large team that look after this 24 seven. And there's not a whole lot of room for improvisation and creativity there. I mean, this is really on track. This is major security economic interest. If you don't have major security and economic interest then suddenly individual who happens to be the foreign minister can have a lot more leeway to actually make initiatives and make decisions that suddenly take the policy in a different direction because it doesn't matter nearly as much. And so, um, so comparative, I've already done a, a few, um, uh, you know, comparisons, but uh, opportunity for democratization and to promote uh, human rights and democracy, super strong in Venezuela. Perhaps it's the best case in the world. Nicaragua, moderate to high opportunity for democratization. Uh, of course, uh, the, um, in 2018, there were demonstrations. There were up to 500 people who were killed by security forces. And this uh, episode is referred to as la crisis, the crisis, you know, in Nicaragua. And ever since then, of course, Nicaragua, uh, Ortega of, uh, is putting more and more of his opponents in jail. And I suspect that by the time they have the election, the whole country will be in jail. And uh, as there is this kind of escalation, Canada is pushing forward more and more of those targeted sanctions, but there's no such thing yet as a sort of a Lima group for Venezuela, uh, for Nicaragua. No attempt made to expand the, the, the sort of the, the, the mandate of the Lima group, uh, given the fact that the OAS protests against Nicaragua, but can't do much about it. So low opportunities for multilateral action um, to, to put some pressure on uh, Nicaragua. Okay, and Cuba, of course, the protests uh, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, ch may be changing uh, things, but 
there's very low uh, opportunity for democratization. You have a lot of opponents and dissonance and dissonant voices, but not per se a democratic opposition with a Guaido as a leader or with a Charles de Gaulle living in Miami that could come back and suddenly head that movement toward democratization in the country. There's no appetite for multilateral uh, action in the hemisphere, at least. Uh, uh, to put pressure on Cuba. And even in light of the recent protests, I don't see a lot of movement there. So I don't know how much time left I have, um, but just a, a few quotations here to show the reaction to those July protests. Uh, well, I, you have uh, at least uh, five or uh, eight minutes. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot. lot. <laughs> well, I am on radio these days. I have 30 seconds. So uh, <laughs> eight, minutes pretty, eight minutes, pretty good. So uh, Trudeau uh, was very reluctant to comment on the protests and on the crackdown of those protests. But uh, fortunately, because elections are coming, he's often out there answering questions from journalists. So a few times journalists ask him about Cuba. And the first time, he said, uh, he made that comment, Canada's always stood in friendship with the Cuban people. We have always called for greater freedoms and more defense of human rights in Cuba. We will continue to be there to support Cubans in their desire for greater peace, greater stability, and greater voice in how things are going. And by then, everybody was sleeping in the room, I'm sure. <laughs> there was nothing there, really. Uh, Global Affairs Canada is uh, our State Department, basically, is foreign affairs. July 13th, spokesperson says, we're closely monitoring the situation. We urge all parties to exercise restraint, like and engage in peaceful and inclusive dialogue, reiterating that Canada supports the right of freedom of expression and assembly, but again, somewhat absurdly saying, calling on all parties to uphold this fundamental right, as if this was a civil war or something. And then during that week, the Foreign Affairs Minister, Marc Garneau, met with uh, US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, as well as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, and both of whom had already made statements on the situation in Cuba. And GAC uh, had issued some statements uh, after those reunions and saying uh, all kinds of things about AIDS and Afghanistan, Belarus, uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, but nothing on Cuba at all. So my, the impression it gave is that they're really scratching their head and asking themselves, what are we going to say? Because they have such sort of, uh, uh, you know, canned messages to talk about engagement with Cuba and they're the same messages always coming out. So July 15, Trudeau is asked the same question and then suddenly there's a change in his, uh, orient, uh, in his um, sort of the, the comment. We deeply we're deeply concerned by the violent crackdown on protests by the Cuban regime. We condemn the arrest and repression by authorities of peaceful demonstrations. And then he said, we stand as we always will with the people of Cuba who wants and deserve democracy, freedom and respect. And this coming from, uh, from Justin Trudeau was I think amazing. Uh, and he did not blame or even mention the US embargo as some of the opposition parties did. I, I was expecting this and he was not coming. So I thought like maybe it's because he's answering questions. It's late in the day, you know, sometimes you're tired or whatnot. But then Global Affairs Canada, July 23rd, meeting between Bruno Rodriguez Parilla uh, uh, and Marc Garneau. And uh, the message is almost identical. Garneau expressed kind of the deep concern over the violent crackdown on protests, particularly the repressive measures against peaceful protesters, journalists, and activists, and arbitrary detention. The people of Cuba deserve their full rights of freedom, speech, assembly, as well as democracy. Uh, Minister Garneau reiterated Canada's commitment to promote and protect human rights globally and called for the rights of the Cuban people to be respected and upheld. And so this is an official statement. It's not just an answer to a question during uh, a meeting. Now, uh, there's still no sanctions. You, we know that uh, President Biden called for to respect human rights and release political prisoners on July 26th uh, and was supported by 20 countries um, and not only Latin American countries, but not Canada, but not France, the UK or Germany either. Uh, and of course, there's no sign that Canada will impose sanctions uh, to Cuban officials. So, you know, basically, so far, it's only a change in language, uh, but I think it is still a very significant change. And I think in, in good part because 
uh, the opportunity for democratization suddenly is has changed. How much, I don't know, um, but it has changed somewhat. Uh, one cannot say that uh, Cuba is a super stable uh, country anymore. I don't think we should say it's a failed state. I agree with uh, Jorge Dominguez comment yesterday. It's, uh, they reacted very quickly and swiftly. It's not like uh, the chaos that you have in Venezuela, but still, the language used by Trudeau and the language used by the Conservative Party leader, who is also a leader of the opposition, was even harsher uh, against Cuba. So that could indicate that the change in Cuba could actually change uh, the foreign policy toward Cuba. Um, and so in conclusion, what would it take for Canada and other countries to push harder for human rights and democracy in Cuba? I think the answer to this is to have opportunity for democratization in the form of a crisis and you know, things not being uh, easy, economic situation difficult, it is not enough to talk about a crisis. I think crisis are turning points uh, where things can go one way or the other. Uh, maybe some kind of democratic opposition getting together. There were some voices saying that foreign countries should actually recognize the democratic opposition in Cuba. And this could be just symbolic. And there's, we all know there's not just one democratic opposition, but giving some profile to something like a democratic opposition would suddenly make it uh, more uh, like easier for states to suddenly move around from a posture of you know, uh, sovereignty and Cuba has been like this forever and it's not worth it versus maybe there's something going on there and we don't want to be seen as lagging on uh, you know, others uh, in a multilateral effort of some sort to give more recognition to the democratic opposition and more criticism to, uh, to the government. And that's what could lead to an opportunity for broad-based uh, multilateral action. And this is my last uh, <laughs> slides. Uh, friends with benefits, you know, like realists always say states don't have friends, they have interests. It's not entirely true. I think the states do have friends. I think uh, US and Canada are friends. Um, but you also have uh, countries that because it's in your interest to be friendly with, you are. Uh, usually those are not quite as solid. And you look at some of the pictures there, and uh, especially Mubarak, who was the darling uh, in Washington, in Ottawa, in London, in Paris, everywhere where he went, uh, because he was an ally of the West in the region, dictat dictator for sure, but there was some hope under George Bush that maybe we could nudge him in the direction of opening up a little bit. And nobody's impatient about it, like it's an aspirational goal. But he was really received warmly. And the one in the corner is Ben Ali, the dictator of uh, Tunisia. And of course, we all recognize Gaddafi. Uh, when there was an opposition, suddenly a crisis in Egypt and a, an opposition, it stretches the imagination a bit to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood as a democratic opposition, but they actually were committing themselves to uh, running elections and have some kind of rule of law. So it was credible enough and you saw all the countries that used to be so warm to our Mubarak, like drop him, uh, like is bad news completely and immediately start supporting uh, the democratic process. And this was done in a, a, literally in days. And so I'm thinking, what would be the threshold for a country like Cuba? What would it take for uh, the international community to suddenly pay more attention to the plight of uh, Cubans and support more vigorously uh, human rights and democracy in Cuba? I think such a crisis, and we may see more episodes of that coming in, uh, would uh, maybe inside the country to do just like Canada did. So at first, it's just in a matter of narrative. There's no sanctions or anything. But once you take that first step, and maybe you prepare the population a little bit to maybe changing a little bit your policy because situation is changing there, then I think uh, you know the international community could play the role uh, that uh, violence play in revolutions according to Karl Marx, you know, la, la, la partera de la historia, the midwife of history. So you, you don't create the change. It has to come from within the island, no doubt about it. Uh, but sort of to ease the, uh, the, the birth of the new uh, toward the end, like to have maybe the international community pushing every, ever so slightly in the right direction could suddenly uh, start making a difference after decades of having neither the embargo uh, 
nor the absence of embargo by everybody else uh, having any significant impact on liberalization and uh, democratization in Cuba. And on that note, I will uh, stop. I think I've been good for time. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to, uh, to questions. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, we will take questions at the end. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Martin Paulus. Is that correct? Martin? More or less. More or less. More or less. What is the correct? Uh, Martin Paulus. Paulus. Martin Paulus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Martin studied at uh, natural science philosophy. He studied natural science philosophy and international law. He received his doctorate of natural sciences in 1974. And then he earned a higher doctorate in political science and philosophy at an associate professorship at Charles University. And then he, in 2007, he got a PhD in public international law. Um, he is a senior fellow and director of the Va Vaclav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy at the School of International and Public Affairs at uh, Florida International University. He's also president of the Vaclav Havel Library Foundation and president of the International Platform for Human Rights in Cuba. So with that introduction, we would like to turn it over to Martin. So make his presentation. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, for having me in this uh, conversation, uh, which I think is very timely because I agree that uh, the events uh, of July 11 in Cuba at least uh, has, have raised uh, uh, some uh, questions and everybody is looking uh, uh, for, uh, for very carefully what is going to happen. I have an opportunity uh, to uh, present my uh, Central European perspective uh, in at different meetings of uh, this uh, August organization and the other places. Uh, so I always need to start uh, that as non-Cuban, uh, I feel a little bit uh, restrained to interfere into domestic matters of other nations, but I uh, put myself uh, intentionally into the position of uh, uh, engaged observer. I'm not just an observer, uh, I'm trying to be engaged, driven by our own Central European experience and encounters with totalitarianism in the past, and then a transition from close to open society, uh, dictatorship to democracy, we experienced ourselves. Uh, so this is my perspective, and maybe because of that, uh, I will be emphasizing uh, certain points uh, focused more on human rights and democratic values uh, than just all these uh, concerns uh, uh, that we have uh, to take into consideration in the real uh, politic. Uh, I think that's uh, what the events of July 11 demonstrated more uh, than clearly that uh, what is the fundamental challenge uh, for Cuba is what I call the possibility of reunification of Cuban nation. Uh, there have been so many efforts made in the past. Uh, they are still efforts to create, I would say, political bodies. So I can think about Encuentro Cubano Nacional in Puerto Rico a couple of, uh, couple of years ago. Now we have new commission for transition uh, in Cuba, uh, just following this uh, the declaration on Pasos de Cambio, uh, and so we can go on and on. Obviously, uh, I agree uh, with the uh, description saying that we have in Cuba on the islands, uh, 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 now maybe a larger and larger group of human rights defenders, civil society activists, artists, uh, and independent journalists, and many, many other people we were using uh, in the past in our times to describe this phenomenon, Charter 77, and uh, related uh, activities, uh, to call it parallel police, which means some sort of public space uh, that does exist that has an, uh, offers an opportunity to individuals to participate in it. But obviously the question is how this parallel police can be effective as a democratic opposition. 
as a serious power in the moment of transition, coming with alternatives and really being able uh, to come up with some uh, decisive uh, impulses for the real transition from A to B. Uh, I will uh, leave this question open for a moment. I will come back to it uh, later. Uh, but I would like to make a couple of comments on the role of international society and of its law in the current Cuban debate. Uh, I have said uh, that uh, it is up to Cubans first. Cubans are uh, responsible or have to be responsible for Cuba's future. Uh, international society can have only some sort of auxiliary uh, role in it, uh, maybe creating enabling environment uh, for changes that uh, had to uh, that have to come from inside of Cuban community. Uh, just to, to give you a couple of historical examples from Central Europe, obviously uh, in the current uh, geopolitical or European situation of the Cold War, Hungarian Democrats had no chance in 1956 uh, to change the, a lot of Hungary. The same is true about Czechoslovakia in 1968. It was when I was a teenager. We all were uh, hoping for freedom, and certainly this concept of socialism with human face was quite, uh, uh, I would say, uh, well, it was a slogan for me, but freedom was what mattered. But it was very short, and on August 21st of that year, we learned the lesson of uh, uh, the uh, politic, international politics in Europe divided to East and West. And same thing was uh, true for Poland in 1981. Solidarność was a, a social alternative and General Jaruzelski, president of Poland, maybe uh, trying to uh, avoid the possibility of Soviet intervention, uh, declared uh, martial law and all my friends from these times happened to be jailed for some time. Uh, so only in the second half of 1980s, uh, Gorbachev uh, effect in Moscow, and maybe uh, Reagan and then George uh, uh, Bush uh, 41, uh, representing uh, the US policy, uh, uh, more, confront more confrontational, uh, confrontational with evil empire, but at the same time trying to find some ways how to deal with this problem in friendly manner and I had to add Helsinki process uh, that uh, started 1975 and trying to come up with formula for peaceful relations between, state, uh, between states with uh, different political and social systems as which of that period was. So uh, 1989 certainly was not, uh, I would say, uh, activity that was dependent only on Václav Havel, Lech Valenza, so people who were uh, inspiring and mobilizing civil society from below. But it was also not only something that was caused by uh, uh, Gorbachev and uh, George uh, Walker Bush, uh, president for the first president of the United States, that met uh, close to the island of Yalta, uh, Malta in the fall of 1989, so some journalists invented then the slogan from Yalta uh, to Malta. So what I'm saying is that these two elements have to come together, uh, enabling international environment and the capability of uh, uh, domestic, uh, let's say democratic opposition come up with alternatives. Uh, let me to uh, give you uh, two arguments, uh, two international arguments just to think about. Uh, the first one I call my own Geneva lessons. Uh, I was a uh, deputy for a minister in that time, and I was a head of uh, Czech delegation at the meeting of Commission for Human Rights. In 1998, the U US sponsored uh, a resolution uh, criticizing the state of human rights in Cuba failed. The reason for failure was that this commission had a new member. It was South Africa. And obviously the relationship with Nelson Mandela and uh, Fidel Castro uh, helped a lot uh, Cuban diplomacy uh, to uh, defeat uh, the US effort. So at that moment, it looked like that the thing was over. I was sitting, uh, I returned back to foreign ministry. I was a deputy foreign minister again. 
Wasserfall was the president. I was visited uh, by uh, Elisardo Sanchez and then uh, approached by other uh, people who were uh, active in the cause of Cuban human rights and democracy. And I was asked whether Czech Republic would be willing and able to bring the ball back and to uh, present the resolution. Uh, as a former dissident myself, I said, yes, of course, uh, we are going to do it. I was backed by President Václav Havel. But only then I learned that uh, I put myself only almost in the mission impossible. Uh, because my first lesson from Geneva uh, in 1999 was uh, that uh, Cuban diplomacy was very powerful engine. Uh, if one can say very easily that Cuba's economy failed from the very beginning uh, of the revolution, uh, international projection of Cuban revolution was a uh, very powerful and uh, master act of Fidel Castro. Cuba has made itself a superpower with diplomatic missions around the world with all the ways how to use South-South or North-South situation, develop developing countries. Uh, so to uh, confront this uh, machine was a not easy task. Uh, and I almost uh, realized that it would be mission impossible. It was mission impossible for more reason, because uh, I had to uh, find who were my uh, strategic partners in this game. Obviously the United States, it was still uh, Clinton administration, Manuel Albright was uh, Secretary of State. Uh, it was a very important partner. And as you know, for US administrations, both Republicans and Democratic, anything like economic language uh, in these type of resolutions were almost no go. But there were other partners uh, that had it uh, other way around. Uh, for them, economic language was a conditio sine qua non. European countries and uh, democratic countries, if I can use this uh, adjective uh, of Latin America. Uh, so I realized that I was finding myself in Bermuda Triangle, uh, operating uh, with our che small Czech boat between the United States, European Union, and Latin America. And, uh, uh, belief that we won this game three times in a row. It was a, a big, big surprise for uh, Castro. And I, I see my Canadian colleague here. It was a roll call vote in 1999 and Canada, that was the last and I was making notes. And after Canada's yes, Canada was yes, very clear, yes. Uh, it was 22 for us, 21 for uh, no's and uh, some abstentions. Uh, so we made it, and the lesson here is that uh, we could have made it only if we were able to keep all these parties of triangle engaged and not promising them that we can uh, resolve a uh, basic problem uh, based on uh, the, the differences on different perspectives of the United States, European countries, and Latin America when it came to embargo or whatever. Uh, and the third lesson was that I had to have all sorts of conversations with uh, partners and I knew that uh, I would not have been able to convince Mexico uh, to support our cause and many, many other cases like that. But it was very important to keep all of them involved in what I would say Havelian conversations. I tried to make my case as clearly as possible we were then defending uh, four uh, dissident Regos Manzano, uh, Marta Beatrix Roque, and two more uh, that were uh, in prison for their uh, initiative, Patria para Todos. Uh, and <clears throat> so we have this human rights case. But I'm saying that we won this thing three times in a row. And I understand that it was a diplomatic game, <clears throat> nothing more than that, multilateral diplomacy. But it seems to me that here we have a very important uh, inspiration or example how to understand our current situation uh, and maybe uh, what can be done within this Bermuda Triangle today. Uh, I don't know uh, how I'm doing with my time, uh, so I will. Uh, so I will go. Keep going. You're fine. Okay. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, so the, the second thing is. Uh, uh, Cuban uh, international responsibility, erga uh, omnes, uh, when it comes to international uh, covenants, especially on civil and political rights, uh, 
signed by the Cuban government in 2008. It was still Minister Perez Roque. And it's interesting to remind ourselves that uh, when uh, he put his uh, Minister for Fairness of Cuba, uh, his signature under this document, uh, the, the uh, so-called uh, um, uh, interpretative declaration was added, trying to say that the uh, Cuban revolution is guaranteeing all the rights to Cuban citizens. So this international stuff is maybe something additional, but not so important. The uh, essential argument is that in uh, interpretative declarations cannot uh, help countries uh, not to be uh, responsible erga omnes for their uh, uh, way how they implement uh, these uh, uh, international agreements. Obviously, Cuba hasn't ratified uh, this uh, these uh, covenants yet, but according to Vienna Convention on Treaties, Cuba is obliged uh, to uh, fulfill all the obligations in good faith or announce uh, that they are not going to uh, follow in the process of ratification. Again, there is a very strong argument in this area. And uh, actually this uh, gives a chance to all, uh, everybody. And actually although it gives some <clears throat> legitimate expectations to Cuban citizens and uh, maybe uh, strengthening uh, legally, not uh, politically, uh, position of human rights defenders. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, my second, the part of my presentation and second of my paper, I've uh, written 24 uh, pages long paper uh, was going to be published uh, very soon. So uh, it will be available for readers. It's about uh, our project called uh, Ideas for Cuba, Initiative for Democratic and Economic Alternatives of Cuba. Our program at FIU is uh, working on together with Inspire America Foundation uh, which is a Miami-based uh, entity, uh, it's NGO, and their uh, focus is uh, on uh, ideas for Cuban uh, democratic future. And this project is interesting uh, for one reason, actually it was opened uh, by the foreign minister of the Czech Republic uh, during his visit to Miami uh, last year. Uh, so it had this uh, kind of uh, coverage from the Czech foreign ministry. What I'm uh, saying here now is not just my private opinions. Uh, I'm consulting all these things uh, with Czech government and I'm also traveling a lot to Brussels, trying to share these ideas uh, uh, with many partners uh, there and also to Washington, but I will come to that. And <clears throat> so this project's uh, uh, question is, uh, what can be done as a first step if a consensus for transition to democracy uh, is reached. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm not speaking about who should be party to this consensus. Uh, it is a other thing, but how transition should uh, go forward. And we, are, we have three areas uh, which we want to be focused on besides one, a big topic, which I call presence of the past which means how to deal with the fact that Cubans uh, and Dentro Fuadar Isla who live outside and inside the island most likely have very different historical experience. Uh, their uh, personal stories are so different. Uh, so the way to forward, uh, go to go forward is to find a way how to uh, share these stories how to discuss them together, how not to be trapped in this uh, uh, Manichaean uh, black white uh, 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 interpretation of Cuban history coined by Castro's regime for ages and maybe having some reaction uh, on the other side as well. Uh, law and uh, economy, I am not uh, able to go here because time constraints to go into details. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, what I would say is, uh, it is not that you either are value-based supporter of human rights or economic pragmatist. I would be arguing that uh, any economic progress, I can think about remittances, I can think about direct foreign investments and I can go on and on, uh, are 
uh, uh, critically dependent on the state of Cuban law. Uh, so Cuban legal system uh, can either create enabling environment for uh, progress or uh, kill uh, any inten good intention uh, if the only and first concern of the government is to keep themselves full power forever. Uh, without that, no transition is possible. So what is our example, uh, inspiration for Cubans from Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic? What happened uh, in the day D of the revolution, November 17, and after, uh, uh, the fact is uh, that legal system uh, stayed in place and some changes were made by one by, uh, by one. Uh, first two articles were removed, uh, speaking of the leading role of the Communist Party from the constitution. Then a deal was reached about co-optation of certain mem uh, members to the existing parliament. Václav Havel was elected uh, president of Czechoslovakia in late uh, December 1989 by the parliament that was a, a result of non, uh, not very democratic elections before. And I also was co-opted, uh, was a four and a half a year uh, deputy uh, of Czechoslovak parliament. We passed the election law, we passed the law on state enterprises and so on and so forth. But the decisive change and a real legal revolution, the concept legal revolution is used in our legal tradition going back to 1918. Legal revolution is discontinuity of the law. It is the moment when a Roman principle lex posterior derogat priori is not valid because it's a new legal order, new material, material basis. So you need to say clearly which laws stay in place so that you are not creating chaos or uh, um, uh, you are not confusing the population, civil codes or private codes or whatever. It happened only in uh, January of uh, 1991 when Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms was adopted and made part of constitutional order of, uh, of Czechoslovakia. And Article 10 of the Constitution said clearly that international uh, covenants on human rights have a, a super uh, legal power uh, within the Czechoslovak Constitution. And this law said that all provisions and on legal instruments that are not compatible with these uh, higher norms uh, cease to be valid by December 31st, 1991. Uh, obviously the question is how can you know uh, how can you reform whole system so that it corresponds with these basic values? But what I'm saying is that uh, revolution in that respect can be a process, can be a negotiated process, uh, can go on in step by step uh, way. And the same thing is economy with the basic uh, problems such as uh, liberalization of prices, uh, privatization and restitution cases, uh, uh, tax reform, uh, <clears throat> stabilization of banks and so on and so forth. I cannot go here into details. But the last and now uh, for me, most important aspect is diplomacy. Uh, uh, of our program is a uh, operation uh, in the academic context of FIU, but we are doing these outreaches uh, to, inter uh, to uh, uh, public sphere I've been communicating with Cuban Americans in Miami. They certainly see the situation from their perspective, but I'm also going to Washington and to, uh, I was actually asked uh, to be there by the State Department and to go to Brussels and Prague so that we can uh, find ourselves in a, a situation in which we understand each other. So what we see on the US side is uh, Biden's new policy that is being delayed and uh, that still needs to be uh, presented. Uh, most likely uh, chairman of Foreign Relations Committee for Menendez is playing an important role here. We have the European policy and- You have, very you have a couple of minutes. Oh, okay, Sorry. okay, couple of minutes, very good. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so we have now on the European side, a debate how to implement this bilateral treaty that regulates the relationship between Cuba and the European Union. What I'm saying is that uh, 
in the context of EU-US uh, relations, it's very clear that US has its bilateral uh, situation, maybe uh, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. Uh, and uh, it's not, it is not possible to uh, find a fusion or amalgamation of European American perspectives, but it's still possible uh, to make them co communicate better and cooperate. Actually, this is the problem some people at State Department are discussing right now, how they can communicate with the European delegation. Uh, now you have uh, all these big declarations uh, that now the uh, dawn of your transatlantic relation uh, is coming or has come. But uh, Cuba is a difficult thing. It's so easy to turn Americans to anti-European feelings and Europeans to anti-American feelings. So uh, the question is, can be done something here so that this relationship, respecting the fact that uh, Europeans have their bilateral uh, instrument in the relationship with Cuba and the United States have uh, the tradition of bilateral policies. My simple message is yes, you can do something about that. And uh, this is uh, a topic <clears throat> that is crucially important uh, for uh, Cuban democratic opposition, whether it's going to operate in an environment in which uh, there will be two schools of thought, maybe European more driven by Spanish influences because uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, foreign minister of the uh, commission for uh, transition in Cuba is Elena Larianaga uh, based in uh, Madrid. So it's something a little difficult for people in Miami because obviously they have their own very specific and rightfully so perspective. Miami is a great hope for Cuba because of remittances, economic strength and economic potential based on, I would say, meaningful and rational cooperation. What I'm saying to Cuban uh, democratic opposition members, both uh, uh, in and out, uh, in, uh, on the island and outside, I work a lot with Rosa Maria Paya and with Orlando Gutierrez, with, with all of them. That uh, the biggest danger for Cuba's future is not in Europe, at least uh, uh, some, I would say, still ideological position, but indifference. Cuba is not bad enough uh, to shock the conscience of Europeans. So what you need to make in Europe is argument why Cuba is important why Cuba uh, really plays an important role. And you can have a lot of arguments uh, uh, in Latin American uh, regional context and you can go on and on. But what I'm saying, and this is my last uh, thought and I will end here. Uh, Cuba, uh, the world needs now a case of successful democratization. Uh, if you look at Middle East with all due respect to this region, uh, you can have certain doubts because of uh, religious, cultural, and geopolitical reasons. But Cuba can be the best possible case. I don't agree uh, with uh, uh, the assessment that Cuba is on the lowest side on this uh, 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 series, uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba. I think that Cuba is the best shot. Havana is the center of all these uh, uh, dictatorial operations. Uh, Havana has the keys, but maybe uh, there might be also some economic pragmatism. In our case, it was prime minister, his name was Adamets. He was a member of Politburo of Communist Party who opened the negotiations with the uh, Václav Havel and Civic Forum. Uh, the army sent the signal that they were going to stay in the barracks. So it was, it was not influenced by anything like military intervention inside of the country. And uh, the, most, the messages coming from Moscow were at the Vashidyalo, it is your business. And uh, the result was uh, maybe problematic. I'm not saying that perfect. Uh, we are now living with democratic problems as any other country in the world but democracy replacing uh, totalitarianism. I believe that Cuba can be best shot. It has a great economic potential. And if the luck is there, democratic opposition in Cuba after July 11 can make it. Thank you.
I'm done. We'd lost Natalia for a minute, so if you can all just hold on one sec. It says that my host has stopped the video. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Yes, you, you've been rehosted. Okay. Uh, Martin, I was in the process of trying to cut you off uh, because your time has ended, but I think we can come back to your point at when we do the question and answer session. Uh, so if you don't mind, can I start with that? Yes, it's time. Okay. Okay, just one second. Let me see if I can get the Q&A here. There are no open questions. Why have people, uh, who answered the question? Yvonne, there was a question for you from Jorge Dominguez. Could you please uh, respond so that everybody can hear the answer? I would have preferred that you hadn't answered it online. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? There was a question for you from Jorge. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. please repeat the question? Uh, he, rec he, uh, he very much liked your presentation and he had a question okay, for good. you. Could you please answer it so everybody can hear the answer? Um, yeah. Um, I think that uh, you have uh, a set of parameters uh, that guide Canadian foreign policy toward Cuba and they have been pretty much the same, I think. There are some differences that are based on partisan, uh, the partisan variable, uh, liberal versus conservative. Sometimes there are differences uh, between different prime ministers, liberal, for instance, Jean Chrétien, uh, was willing to bet on having sort of closer relations to Cuba but he went to visit uh, Fidel Castro and he went very poorly. And so he put everything on Northern ice, as he said after. So some difference within the Liberal Party and within the Republican, within the <laughs> Republican, within the Conservative Party, I think Brian Mulroney had cordial business-like uh, relations with, uh, with Cuba and he, they even exchanged uh, a few letters. And so there was some kind of mutual respect between them, whereas under Harper, uh, Harper was seen as someone who had a bit more ambition, first of all, in the Americas with his America strategy. And he had uh, nine foreign ministers. A few of them liked once in a while to take a stand against uh, Cuba, uh, celebrating. There's a day, I think it was under George Bush, uh, celebration of uh, freedom in Cuba. And so he made a statement uh, about this. This was the only time it was done. Uh, when there was someone in jail, he would uh, uh, especially Bernier and Bade, two foreign ministers, would say things openly critical of Cuba. But by and large, um, it, uh, you know, it depends very much on sometimes what's going on in Cuba. And there are some variations, as I said, in style, but the parameters remain the same. And I think that uh, uh, Canadian foreign policy is not like US foreign policy. I think uh, there are some files that are very important and, and most files are not that important. There's a great deal of uh, like the Latin American desk, the Cuban desk, the Venezuela desk, which has expanded now. Uh, people stay there for a year and a half, two years. There's a great deal of rotation. In some instances, the embassy is very active. In Venezuela, the Canadian embassy was tremendously active under Harper and continued under uh, Trudeau, uh, promoting like projects that are clearly critical of the government. This really never happened in Cuba. So, uh, and ambassadors have changed. This hasn't really, really changed. So I think because of the lack of relative, like uh, super importance, uh, economic importance of Cuba, although there are some Canadian investments there, so enough to think that you shouldn't mess too much with it. But I think it's been really on track uh, for, for a number of years and even decades. Uh, there are about 30,000 Cuban Canadians. So it's a very small community. They're not very well organized, unlike the Cuban Americans. The groups that are organized in this country about Cuba are all related to the Cuban uh, embassy or the consulates. They're all super cheerful for the Cuban regime. So, um, you know, so there is no, in, in parliament, there is a, a friendship group in parliament, a uh, friendship between Canada and Cuba. This is not extraordinary. There are such uh, friendship groups between many countries. 
but they organize events and they never really uh, criticize uh, Cuba. It's almost as if, you know, it's, you know, this policy has been put in place long time ago and we're not going to change it unless something happens. And this time something happened and you saw this shift at least in the tone, especially coming from someone like Justin Trudeau, I think this indicates to me that what looks like very solid, uh, sort of sustainable policy may be uh, actually more uh, shallow and fickle and brittle than we think. Um, and that if more changes of that nature uh, happens in Cuba, then maybe Canada and maybe other countries as well uh, could actually uh, change their tone, I think, uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to Cuba. And uh, I, I won't take too much time, but one foreign minister in particular was very, very committed to the Venezuela file, Christian Freeland. Uh, there was never a Cuban foreign, uh, a Canadian foreign minister that really decided to put take that on, like to really push hard on on Cuba. Whenever there's an attempt to uh, get closer and do something together, it's usually an attempt to to work harder toward being closer and then it fails and then they go back to the northern ice and a sort of more business as usual type of relations. But thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Martin, I had um, a short question and a longer question for you. If you don't mind, I'd like to go next if you can unmute yourself. And my short question is, as a lawyer, I was interested in your description of how Czechoslovakia went through the process of changing the, the it's, um, you know, it's basically its legal system or political, the underpinnings of its legal system. And in particular, that you remove the Communist Party from the Constitution, but it sounds like you did that by legislative action. When did you ever have a referendum to adopt the new Constitution? Actually, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, the leading role of the uh, Communist Party was uh, cemented in Article 1 and 4 uh, of the Constitution. And it was a, a proposal by the government, by the uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister for Legislation, Marianne Chalfa. He then uh, became a Prime Minister working with Václav Havel who came with this suggestion. So it was a uh, initiative of the executive branch of the government, uh, of the government, the federal government, and federal uh, parliament uh, decided, still uh, full of people from uh, the ancient regime, uh, that this um, proposal was accepted and uh, three fifths of uh, members of parliament were supporting it. It was not a referendum. It was a decision of uh, federal legislative organ. Okay, so my it's, it's interesting um, that the second question I had for you really has to do with it has to do with Cuba, and you mentioned that you have worked with people outside of dissidents, you know, op opposition opposes opposing uh, people who oppose the Cuban government in Miami and, and outside of Cuba and then inside of Cuba and. I want to know what you think, what you think is a scenario for, a likely scenario for really uh, bringing back the, the Cuban community, engaging the Cuban community or as a participant within, um, you know, a Cuba in the future. Um, because given, you know, the history, the different stories, as you point out earlier, that people have told, there's a big gap between, uh, you know, the, the mythology in each place. How do you overcome that? How do you? Well, uh, I mentioned that uh, we have a project uh, supported financially by the foreign ministry of the Czech Republic. Uh, also in Miami, the president of the past, there is a uh, NGO, very successful one in Czech Republic called Post Bellum, and they run maybe the largest uh, archive. Uh, called Memory of Nations, uh, registering encounters of individuals with totalitarianism uh, during the 20th century and even now. So now after three years, we have at least 200 uh, depositions or cases from Cuba, from both inside and uh, outside of the island. So we are part of certain communication and can witness extremely interesting uh, 
exchanges uh, between people who see uh, the life and experience from uh, uh, the situation from, the, uh, fr from their own life experience. That's one thing. But uh, to your other question, uh, dynamics in uh, Miami and maybe in Cuba and around the world. Uh, it was very interesting to observe certain change uh, now, uh, even way before uh, July 11, uh, even uh, because obviously we are heading in the United States to midterm election and uh, partisanship is uh, going, uh, having big time. But those even on Republican side understand that this must be bipartisan, uh, that it must serve the needs of Cuban people and not to be uh, swallowed uh, by dynamism or dynamics of American domestic uh, politics. Uh, so I think it's very interesting uh, to see the communication between uh, Senator Bob Menendez, he's Democrat, but he's very strongly on the Cuban side and both parties in Miami. Then uh, the transatlantic relations uh, between uh, civil society groups, Cuban Am Americans, Cubans in Europe, in Madrid, but elsewhere. And it seems to me that the, what I call reunification of Cuban nation, obviously it has a lot of details and devil is in details uh, concerning passports, citizenship, uh, right to vote, uh, the new vision of the nation. But you know, you can go back to the old questions of Jose Marti, all big Cubans were uh, somewhat connected with uh, American liberal experience. But all of the all of the people that you all these groups you describe are opponents or outside of Cuba. The majority of people in Cuba haven't left because they've chosen to stay there. I don't think that 100% of the people in Cuba would leave right now. So the question is, how do you bridge that gap between well, uh, people uh, who, who you know who were raised? There, in there are still people like Hernandez Gomez Manzano, uh, uh, Daniel Ferrer, and they are still leaders of uh, Cuban democratic opposition. And you can think about Manuel Cuesta Morua, uh, and you have a long list of names. You can go to the, uh, to the church structures. Uh, Carlos Saladillas is still having his uh, microeconomic uh, uh, instruction series uh, there. Uh, uh, and uh, it is uh, done through the church uh, communities. So I think that they, there is a connection between people outside and inside uh, of Cuba. Uh, there is a still big question, what about uh, remittances? Uh, what kind of uh, change we are going to see uh, next month, uh, this year or later? But uh, this is not just a private help to uh, uh, family members. It should have some, I would say, public effect. And obviously, if you see the policy of the European Union implementing the treaty, again, there is a lot that can be done to strengthen the domestic independent uh, democratic community in Cuba. Um, Martin, uh, I would like to allow, Sylvia, could you please ask the next question yourself? Uh, Sylvia has a question rather than my reading it. Let me ask her to ask it. If you could unmute, Sylvia. Okay, I am unmuted. Um, I was thinking about the connections between the presentation by Yvonne and the presentation by Martin, and both of which were really very, very good. Um, Yvonne was talking about the change that has just taken place in Canada's attitude towards Cuba, given the protests of July 11th. Um, and that's very important. And I think it goes very well with Martin Palou's point about the importance of the enabling international environment to promote change. I think that until now, most countries and the left inside of democratic countries like the United States and Europe, that for most of those people, the Cuban revolution and the US embargo were a way of criticizing the United States. In other words, people were not paying attention to Cuba or Cubans lives inside of Cuba. They were paying attention to, I want to criticize the United States. It's the David versus Goliath, you know, uh, most enduring image. 
that will come out, I think, of the Cuban Revolution. I'm sure that someday they'll make a movie <laughs> out of it. Um, so after I think that after July 11th, these same nations and these same groups inside of democratic nations will have to pay attention to the lives of people inside of Cuba, because I think they were very good at putting up their pancarts, uh, pancartas, their you know, posters saying SOS Cuba, and also saying Patria y Vida, fatherland and life. Uh, and I think that they can no longer be ignored in the same way that they have been ignored by the international community until now. Okay, we have some other questions I'd like to get to. Roger Betancourt has a question for Carlos Romero. He wants to know what the prices at which the oil was trading for, uh, for the doctor or health personnel services. What are the prices? Sí. Bueno, la relación entre Cuba y Venezuela desde el punto de vista petrolero te, tiene tres niveles. El primero es proveer de petróleo por un intercambio comercial entre sectores sociales que vienen a Venezuela y Venezuela le da petróleo. La es primero, petróleo. Segundo, es un petróleo subsidiado porque nunca estuvo sujeto al mercado interno, al precio del mercado internacional. Siempre estuvo alrededor de los 20 dólares el barril. Y hubo momentos, por ejemplo, en el 2013, 2014, 2015, que críticos de la relación cubano-venezolana advertían que había un efecto negativo en ganancia para Petróleos de Venezuela, la empresa petrolera estatal venezolana, dado el hecho que eh, eh, había una distancia muy grande entre el petróleo vendido a Cuba en precios regulados y el precio del de petróleo internacional. Entonces, esa factura petrolera siempre estaba alrededor de los 20 dólares. Inclusive en los últimos meses, ustedes saben que ha venido aumentando el precio del petróleo internacional y también vuelve a tener una consideración crítica y un debate por qué Venezuela le está dando a eso. Ahora, hay un último elemento, rápido, un último elemento, que es que también Venezuela ha permitido que Cuba reexporte parte de lo, el envío de barriles de petróleo y por muchos años ha sacado una ganancia a partir de esos 20 dólares por reexportarlo en mercado internacional. Okay, I have another question I want to make sure we get to. We're a little bit over time, but we started late. So let me get to this question. And the question is for Yvonne, I can't make out the whole name, only the first name, Christopher. But the question, Yvonne, is given the slight shift in tone uh, of Trudeau and Garneau on Cuba, what might Biden administration ask of Canada with respect to Cuba policy? Canada didn't sign the recent statement, but could Canada be a asked by the U.S. to serve as a go-between with Europe to increase pressure on Cuba or to in impose Magnitsky uh, sanctions or take other steps? We can't hear you. Yvonne. Yeah, no, I'm good, I'm good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, the U.S. not only uh, tolerated, but in fact, uh, uh, accepted and took advantage of a Canadian uh, re relation, like diplomatic relation uh, with Cuba. And since uh, the early 60s, and actually the Canadian embassy was providing all kinds of information to its US counterparts. And I've done that for, for a number of years. Um, the rapprochement between uh, the United States under President Obama and Cuba under Raul Castro was facilitated by a conservative uh, government in Canada. And actually some of the meetings they had, the Cubans and the Americans took place in an hotel in Toronto. So this is something that the Cuban, the Canadians have done for the Americans for 60 years. And whether it would be in this case to help them with Europeans, I think that Europeans are big enough uh, to contact the Americans directly and vice versa. Um, but uh, uh, obviously when uh, Mr. Blinken came uh, and, and talked to Garneau, I am absolutely sure that they talked about Cuba. They just haven't uh, come to an agreement. They were willing to, uh, to convey uh, to the public, but I'm sure they talked about it. And I think whenever the US is asking something to Canadians, uh, uh, contrary to what some Canadians think, we don't always agree, but we always take it very, very seriously. 
And sometimes there are moments when uh, global affairs and the government sounds like not really serious because of that maybe lack of professionalism or because it, the file is not that important. There aren't too many uh, people attached to it, like the Venezuela Bureau until four or five years ago. I think there were three people there only. Um, and so you would have things like, for instance, at some point, uh, the Canadian government saying that Cuba could actually almost join the Lima group and help solve the crisis in Venezuela. This was really, really bizarre, right? Uh, on the assumption that it's like uh, the peace process in, in, uh, in Venezuela, that the Cubans somewhat, uh, in Colombia, is that Cubans somewhat helped as if, you know, uh, helping uh, getting rid of uh, a, a clutch of uh, uh, outdated guerrilleros in the woods of Colombia was the same to Cuban interests than uh, something as important as Venezuela. So it was nonsense, but it was corrected almost uh, immediately. They stopped saying this. And I think like the dream that somewhat Cuba could be, that Canadians could use their, their, their relations with Cuba to help with transitions in Venezuela. I think it's this myth has had a very short uh, lifespan. And the last thing I would say is that about public opinion um, that was raised a little earlier, uh, when Fidel Castro died, uh, Justin Trudeau had uh, made a, a speech that was not vetted, I'm sure, by Global Affairs, in which he was saying that even Castro's opponent uh, recognized how much of a, a great uh, leader, uh, loving of his people and things like this. And after that, uh, it became a source of, of jokes in Canada. In social media, there were memes and stuff like that. In the media, it was almost like, uh, you know, from, from the left to the right saying it was inappropriate and so on. So I think the public opinion in Canada has changed a bit. And, and why? For the same reason that young people in Cuba are not so enamored with the Barbudos anymore, because, uh, you know, most people were not there in 1958-59. And I don't know if you've seen t-shirts with a portrait of Diaz Canel on it. Uh, me neither. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> like the mystique of Guevara and, and Castro will disappear pretty fast if uh, Mr. Diaz Canel remains in power and that's the leader that they see all the time when they hear about protests and crackdown of protests in Cuba. Okay, I, it's now 12.06 uh, and I'm sure unless Gary has anything, any concluding, any comments to make, we should probably conclude this. Um, Gary, speak up or forever hold your peace. I'm always having trouble not holding my peace, but anyway, I've been trying to. I, I just, <laughs> I wanted to make a comment. Um, I was in Havana 97 to 99, but I guess Christian was the prime minister. And um, Canada was really trying very, very hard to um, develop a relationship with Cuba to the point that the cooperation that um, was mentioned between the two, the two missions there um, really got very strained. Not, on the part of the United States, but on the Canadian ambassador who didn't want anything to do with us. And then Christian came down and I, my re recollection is that he was very embarrassed with, by the, react, the lack of reaction he got from Cuba and got a lot of criticism back home. I, I'm not sure of that, but there was an article many years ago, I have the term millennium, I think it was entitled, in fact, Northern Nice, which uh, discussed that in great detail. Um, just an observation. Thank you all for a great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. And then let me thank the panelists. Uh, thank you very much. I know that um, you are very busy people and in another continent, one of you is in another continent. So I really appreciate your making yourself available and responding and getting the slides, uh, managing your slides and all of that. So. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back Thank at you. two o'clock. Three countries. <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank Thanks you very much. Bye-bye.